Son, may Allah bless you. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you. You know, personalities like yourself here are, I think, an important piece of the equation that brings about unity and harmony. Yes, my brother. Salam, brother. I understood the majority of the Muslims are Sunnis, and as I know, I've seen on campus, and the Shias feel that since the MSA is dominated by Sunnis, they feel left out and they don't usually come. So how how would how would we go about in like attracting the Shias to be not afraid, like they can come and pray, they can come hang out with us, and not to be afraid of us because we're not going to do anything to them. May Allah bless you. It's an excellent question. You know, how do we bring the Shias in and you know make them not feel uh, unwelcome and so on? I think it, that's our responsibility and obligation as a, as a Muslim community. Uh, when we have a very amicable environment, forget even the Shia, the Christians, the Jews, other groups will start joining. You'll be surprised. I was just speaking at the uh, Islam Awareness Week here in Salisbury. And one of the members of the Muslim Student Association is the president of the Jewish Student Association. And he attends all the lectures. And he speaks eloquently about Islam, showing how, and he calls it, these are our cousins, and these are our brothers. Now, for somebody who may not like Islam, like Islam doesn't matter. When a person can call your cousin, how difficult is it going to be now to stigmatize and kill the opposite? It's very hard, because now you've, you've bridged, you see? This is how our messenger used to do. Even when he took over Khaybar, which was a fortress of the Jews, he allowed the Jews to continue to remain there, and to continue to be in charge of those areas. Why? Because he doesn't want to insult them, and to break and to take away their dignity. So between us also, we need to do the same. Unfortunately, and look from you know, and I don't like to speak about those kinds of issues. We've got to look at the positive side, but there are many MSAs that are intolerant of people coming to pray slightly different from them, and we've got to remove that. We've got to educate each other. See, like in our Islamic center, we've got Sundays who come, who fold their hands, who say Amin after Surah Fatih. No problem. Perfectly fine. No problem. Brother says, yes, I'm going to fold. I said, don't even tell me. It's your way of salah. It's between you and Allah. Who am I to adjudicate what you should be doing? It's between you and Allah. And I respect you for that. The fact that you've taken the time to pray to Allah, that's the most important thing. The difference of salah is between our discussions and we can, we can you know, Allah bless you, inshallah, ma salam, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, it, it, that's upon us to figure it out. But at the end of the day, unless we create an open society, this animosity is not going to go away. I think the political situation today, with the Sunni Shia divide coming up on the surface, is now forcing both sides to come and embrace the other side. So in my opinion, it's backfiring on the, on the plans of the enemies of Islam. It's backfiring. And I, I, I was even questioned about this in, my, in one of the universities about Salman Rushdie's book, Satanic Verses. He said, what do you think about satanic verses? I said, it's interesting, you know. We can, we can say God doesn't exist. I mean, this is a very controversial issue I'm going to say. You even question the Holocaust, you go to jail. Right? You even question the Holocaust, you go to jail. I say, well, what's, what's amazing is that the minute you say satanic verses, well, that's freedom of expression. I said, that's okay for freedom. Express you know, satire, make a satire of a person who's sacred to something, that's okay. Freedom of expression. You don't even go to jail. And I said, you know what? I said, you want my opinion? I said, that was a tactical maneuver to divide the Muslim Ummah, to check us. It was designed to check us to see how lethargic and lazy we really are. I said, well, they found out the wrong way. <laughs> I said, it's interesting. I said, if, if a Muslim had written a book about Jesus or about the Holocaust or anything, the British government, would they support and protect him for his life? I said, Salman Rushdie is under constant protection. Why would the British government spend millions of dollars to protect a man for having written a book out of his own whimsical mind, right? He's making money, he's made millions of dollars. Let him protect himself. I said, it's a political maneuver to divide us. And we're not going to be party to this. We're a united Ummah. And after, after that, people realized that those accusations that the Shias are worshipping Ali ibn Abi Talib came out false because the book does not speak about Ali ibn Abi Talib. It vilifies the Holy Prophet. And the Shias rose and said, how dare you make such a statement against our Prophet. And it united the Ummah. And they realized, oops, don't mess around with the Muslim Ummah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. And by the way, please don't be politically correct with me. You know, oh, it's lovely, we're all, you know. Political correctness, I don't believe in that. Ask it like it is, tell it like it is, I have no problem. Okay, yes brother. There is no such thing as politics that exists today. The only thing that exists from my point of view is that the movements are grounds. Because of one in the Muslim family, that's why we say, okay, you're a movement, but it's not really following your life. 
we Muslims are blind. Are you generalizing or are you spe specifically speaking about somebody you know for yourself? Okay, so you feel that you as a Muslim you're blind. Aha. Uh -huh. So your question is what? How, you know, how do we get this true message to the people? But well, excellent question you're asking. We're all born in our own religions. And there's a tendency to be loyal to your own religion. Okay? That's human nature. But Allah in the Quran answers this problem in a very systematic way. And He tells us how to do it. But here's the principle. He says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا so Allah asks the question, Okay, when they are told, why don't you follow that which God revealed, they said, no, we follow what our fathers followed. Okay? So Allah says, even if your fathers are, are going to hell, or even if they are going in the, in the wrong pathway, you'll follow them. So what Allah SWT wants you and me to understand is, know your pathway. What is this path? Is it right? First question you and I need to ask is about deity and God. Is there a necessity for God? Why do we believe in God? So there are the theists and the non-theists, or the atheists. The majority are theists in the world. Majority. I'd say a good 95% of the world's population is theistic somehow. Either with one God or multiple gods, but we're theistic. Why is there belief in God? Well, purify Tawheed. When I speak with my Christian brother, the only thing I talk about is Tawheed. The only thing. I don't get into anything else. We find Christians have a very difficult time explaining the Trinity to anybody, including themselves, but when it comes to us, when we talk to them, what we find is that we purify them towards the Tawheed. The minute you take them to the Tawheed and say, Jesus is not Son of God, never claimed to be Son of God, He is just a prophet of God, He even says it, my Father is greater than I. It is not of, thy, of my own will that I do, but the will that sent me. When He was cornered in the Temple of Sulaiman, when the Jews, you know, I, I, I've been asking this question for 25 years, no one's been able to answer this question. Simple, simple questions. When, you know, I, I studied, I went to Bible study, I used to attend Bible study twice a week. One question nobody can answer. I say, well, if you say Jesus is the Son of God, just to give a simple example on how we understand the truth. I say, let's ask Jesus, forget Paul. Forget the disciples. Disciples are not important. Who is better than the very man who is important? It's true, true. So of course, second-hand information is not the same as first-hand. I said, let's ask Jesus, did he say that? He said, okay, tell me. I said, in the temple, temple of Solomon, in John, you find Jesus turns the tables upside down and the Jews corner him because they're angry. Because the Jews were selling religion. You know, and by the way, when I say Jews, I don't mean the Jews of today. They're good Jews, bad Jews, good Muslims, bad Muslims. That's not generalized. Stereotypical generalizations are dangerous. Okay? Good Sunni is good Shias, bad Sunni is bad Shias. In every community, it's good and bad. So that particular Jewish group, the Sadducees, the, the, the Pharisees, who were the troublemakers, didn't like Jesus because he was turning their business upside down. So they corner him. It says in the Bible, clearly. And as Jesus is cornered, he says, for which of my crimes will you punish me for? And the Jews says, none. Thou callest thyself a son of God. Thou committest blasphemy. Look, clear accusation. You are claiming to be a son of God. That's a big mistake. What does Jesus answer? SubhanAllah. Even in the Bible, you can see how Jesus answered. He says, is it not in thy scriptures that thee are children of God? Don't you yourself call yourself sons of God? Why are you accusing me? And no Christian to date has been able to answer that question. Why didn't Jesus just say, yes I am, you got a problem with that? <laughs> I mean, does Allah have haya? Does Allah have fear? لا يستحي. Allah, Allah is not afraid of truth. He'll tell you the way it is. And if that's the central pivot position that I'm going to be saved by, then Jesus didn't do us a favor by telling us, yes, he is. When Pontius Pilate is saying to people, say you're the son of God. He says, so you say. I said, show me where Jesus says, yes, I am. You got a problem? Worship. Christians walk away thinking, wow. I said, that's all I need to do. I don't want you to become a Muslim. It's not my objective. I'm not here to knock on your doors. It's come on. You know, here's a Quran. Start reading it. I mean, I want you to be Muslim. No. I want you to read it. If you think it's good, follow it. If you don't like it, no problem. La ikrah fid din. There's no compulsion in religion. Put it back in your bookshelf. Hopefully somebody else will read it. 
So, we are blind in many ways, but charity always begins at home. You know, we say, Amr bin Ma'roof, you know, enjoying the good. You know what it means? People say to me, it means you go tell others how good you should be. I said, no, that's not what it means. He said, no, I'm not going to I said, no, no. What it means is you stand on the mirror and you point at yourself. That's Amr al Ma'ruf. Don't tell anybody. You don't, we should tell people good things and, and, and keep. But Allah says, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why do you say that which you don't do? No. Amr al Ma'ruf is here. Me. I must do it. If I don't believe in it, don't tell others to do it. It's wrong. Even if it's good. Because if I tell somebody to do something good, like, brother, why aren't you praying? Okay, I said, okay, I'm sorry, brother, yes, you're right. And then suddenly he sees me not praying. He says, okay, brother, how come you're not praying? Said, oh, look, I told you something good, right? It doesn't mean I have to do it. What does the guy think? The guy thinks, if you told me I should do it, and you don't do it, then either what you're doing, asking me to do, is no good, or you are no good. Usually, we tend to lump everything together. A no good guy told me to do something good, which is not good, so the whole thing is not good, so trash it. And that's a problem. That's why Allah says, Kaburat. Allah hates when people tell others to do something they don't do it themselves. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but... No. Any other questions, comments? Yes, brother. Okay, you said not to be polit politically correct, so take a deep breath. Um, no problem, brother. With pleasure. <laughs> one of the most, like, common thing amongst... I mean, me personally, amongst Sunni brothers and my friends that we talk about when we talk about the Shia is the issue of temporary marriage in the Shia doctrine. So Correct. I just want you to elaborate on that. Okay, good. Marriage is a contract. Okay? It's a contract. Even a permanent marriage is a contract. And the contract is very short. If you look at the size of the contract, it's only a 15 second contract. The girl says, I marry myself to you, based on the agreed upon dowry, and the boy says, Pabil to it's done. Finished. It's a contract. You hold, Allah holds you liable. But even in a permanent marriage, you can break it. Two hours later, five hours later, a day later, you can break it. You can walk away from it, right? Under a condition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran speaks about temporary marriage. And from our historical perspective, from both schools of thought, it's clearly understood that in our Prophet's lifetime, temporary marriage was not abolished. Was not abolished. Now here comes the basic question. Who are we supposed to follow? What comes after the Prophet, or what the Prophet say? Well, clearly what the Prophet say. So the Prophet did not abolish. Some of I was practicing our Prophet's time, it's a temporary marriage. In fact, researchers, even... Uh, actually, in fact, Sachiko Murata, I think she... Her husband is here at this Estonian group. Chilik. William Chilik. Yeah. His wife is, is here, right? I think she's been there. But she's done a thesis, a master's thesis on Muta. You should ask her about this question, about the sociological implications of Muta. But that's secondary. You know what? I'll tell you one rule in Islam. Okay? All of us should follow. One rule in Islam we must never forego. Anybody asks you about prayer, your hijab, my salah, or what I do, which my prophet has commanded me to do, when someone says, why do you do it, don't go into the scientific, sociological ideologies about it. It's secondary. First answer, my Lord has commanded it upon me. Now you want to talk about its pros and cons? We can. But even if you show me 99% con and 1% pro, I don't care. Because my Lord has shown me, and it's clear, in the Quran, it's clear, and by the way, you never get anybody giving you 99% con and 1% pro about any of the laws that Allah said in the Quran. To date, I have yet to find somebody who's able to pin me on a wall. Impossible. But even if you use that extreme example, we have to understand that it's the commandable law. So mut'a is a commandable law which Allah has allowed. It's temporary. People say, oh, this is legal prostitution. You can give it any name you want. The difference between prostitution Okay, is that there is no God and there is no command of Allah and the, the, the rules of Allah's uh, decree are not under practice. Meaning, even in temporary marriage, a woman has to remain in Idda before she can spend time with another man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed it you know, uh, to be practiced, but it's not easy for someone to practice Mut'a. Mut'a was abolished in the same Caliph's time. Now, there are some who say that Hadith shows that our Prophet had 
abrogated this in some way in the battle somewhere. If you examine that, there's a rule in Islam. The Qur'an cannot be abrogated, meaning Nasir and Mansukh, Qur'an cannot be abrogated by anything other than itself. No hadith out there can cancel a verse in the Qur'an. No. The Qur'an has the power to cancel a hadith, but a hadith cannot cancel the Qur'an. Otherwise, the Qur'an doesn't become the central driving force of the believer, because it becomes a game then. Because I can take hadith and cancel the Qur'an, and I can take the Qur'an and cancel it, not acceptable. So mut'a, from the shari'i point of view, was practiced in our Prophet's time. It was not abolished by the Holy Prophet. The Qur'an maintains it, and that's the end of the story. Now, if you say, well, there are people who abuse it. I say, there are people who abuse permanent marriage too. They use their women as slaves. There are women who use their husbands as slaves. Whatever the case may be. And they use marriage as a means to, to push their agendas. Laws of Allah can be used to be abused and can be used for the good thing. We just have to be wise and prudent. And not to say, well, Shias practice mut'a, so they're wrong. Forget that. If someone comes to me and says, Sunnis do such and such, the first question I ask is, did the Prophet allow it? Because if he did, then they are right, and I am wrong. Simple. I don't care if it's Sunni who does it, okay, or a Shia does it. Did the Prophet and does the Quran allow it? If it allows it, it's a done deal. It's not for me to spin it, because the minute I start spinning one, hey, let's start spinning everything else. I can show you scientific evidence today, homosexuality is on the rise, Quran forbids homosexuality, let's start being you know, apologetic, and let's start becoming politically correct today and allow X, Y, Z to behave in certain ways from scientific angles. Where does the Qur'an stand then after that? Right? Thank you. Yes, brother. Well, as you said, uh, basically the way we work is we follow the Qur'an, we follow the Sunnah, right? There's, huh? a, there's a pact of belief of Muslim. Now, also Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yes. said to follow my example and follow the example of my rightly guided pilots. Meaning, people who came after him, right? We all know this is clear. Not many people can argue about this. Now, when you have these four people who came after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is an accepted belief in the Aqid of the Sunnah. And the action of the four Khalifas took, whether it means canceling Mutaf, whether it means doing this, whether it means doing that, to be accepted because that's part of our belief, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also has another hadith like you pointed out, where he is said to have canceled Mutaf marriage. You said, um, Asad and Mansur, you said that we can't cancel the Quran with the hadith, right? You said that, right? No hadith can cancel the Qur'an. No hadith can cancel the Qur'an. But the thing is, when you look at the Qur'an, you don't look at it in that level of generality. You have to understand that there's also history, right? Be before something's revealed, and after the Prophet ﷺ says something else, Allah SWT also tells us in the Qur'an, you have to follow Allah SWT, and you have to follow the Prophet. Correct. This is why the majority of Muslims, right, they like they agree, Sunnis believe that Muta is not Allah, right? You know, and this is all based on history. Like, you have your opinion, we have our opinion. And obviously, we're never going to compromise. No, no, it's not a question of compromise, it's a question of discussion, and no one's asking you to compromise. So, and I don't want you to take that, that angle to say, well, you want me to compromise, or you want me to give up. But let's, let's discuss the initial question. You said, Prophet said, follow my rightly guided killers. Which hadith is this that you quoted? Where does it say that the Prophet has said there before rightly guided killers? This is follow the rightly guided killers. Which one? Because how many rightly guided killers do we have? Four. Did the Prophet ever say four? But, but why four? Why not five? Why not twelve? Why not thirty-two? Why not fifty-nine? Why only four? Did the Prophet state four? No, it was a four, right? Well, of the most important names out of his companions, you know, Abu Bakr. It was accepted uh, belief, obviously. No, no, accepted belief. I, you know, let's forget about accepted beliefs. I want to know what the Prophet say. Accepted belief. You know, if that's the case, the Christian will say, "Listen, it's accepted belief. Jesus is God." It's not true. Too many people say Jesus is God. That doesn't mean it's true. The point is, did the Prophet say they're four? No, okay. Did the Prophet appoint them? Did the Prophet appoint them? What do you mean not necessarily? When you said not necessarily, you're saying there is room that there was an appointment. So, is there any indication from your perspective that the Prophet appointed the four caliphs? Okay, so if he didn't, have we not... Are we not following, are we, are, how do we know we're following his right? Because if the Prophet didn't appoint them, and you said it's an accepted fact, and Quran says Khalifa is always Ja'la, the word Ja'la is always preceded before the term Khalifa. Inni Ja'il fil ardi I will make. 
Even Ibrahim, when he becomes an imam, inni ja'iluka linnasi imama, we are making you. So the question is, God has to appoint the Khalifa. God has to appoint the representative. Man cannot. Because we know all the prophets that came from Adam to the last messenger, not a single prophet or messenger for that matter was appointed by people. Right? Was anyone appointed by people? None. So if none was appointed by people, and the last messenger was leaving us with the entire complete religion, this Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum, the Kamil, complete Deen, how can it be that the representatives are not appointed and chosen? So you're saying that because the Deen has been completed... Correct. You know, the question is not Abu Bakr, Omar, good, bad. <laughs> Who am I to judge? On Yom al Qiyam, I don't even, I'll be saying nafsi, nafsi. You know, Allah says it's not, none of your business to be passing judgments on people. We're not passing judgments. We're talking about authority. Did the Prophet appoint them? If he appointed them, we have to follow, finish. If he did not appoint them, then we have to look elsewhere. Because there has to be an appointment. Because there's an ayah in Surah Nisa, verse number 59. I always ask, who is that third group? Obey Allah, all you believe. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. Now, if you look at the verse of the Quran, and you know that you and I, we both believe, Quran is perfect in its usage, its words, its angles, the way it speaks. Nobody can challenge it. Quran uses the term ita'at twice. Ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa ulil amr minkum. Ulil amr minkum's ita'at is coming from the second. Allah didn't say ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa ati'u ulil amr minkum. No. Ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa ulil amr minkum. Ulil amr minkum's ita'at is from the first two. The third has to be appointed by the second. It's a command. And by the way, there are two kinds of commands. You find Allah has commanded us to obey our parents. But what's saying that insana bi walidayn? It's a command of Allah, right? Enjoying goodness upon the parents. But even that is conditional. When your parents ask you to worship anyone other than Allah, don't obey them. Not allowed. SubhanAllah. It's conditional. Here, Allah wa minkum, you find is unconditional. Meaning, whatever that third group tells me, like you mentioned, yes, if they aggregate something, whatever, right? That means it's probably an abrogation of the Prophet. For example, from the Shia perspective, when an Imam says something, it says, this is how it is, people say, well, this is an Imam saying. It says, to us, an Imam is a reflection of the Prophet. He doesn't bring new laws, he doesn't cancel laws. He simply reflects the laws of God. He's not allowed to bring the Buwa. He, they, imams have no Buwa in them. They're just a reflection. And the Prophet gives a beautiful tafsir about Imam Ali in this. He says, wa shamsi wa duhaha wal qamari idha talaha. The Prophet said, this shams is me. I am that sun. And qamar is Ali ibn Abi Talib who reflects me. Wa qamari idha talaha. And the, the moon which follows, and the, the equation of the moon is it's a reflection. It takes the light from the sun. So they don't bring new laws. And therefore it's rational and logical that the Prophet had to have appointed somebody. Because look, between the Sunni and Shia, the discussion is about who succeeded the Prophet. If we say the Prophet didn't appoint somebody, then I can turn around and say that the Prophet didn't fulfill his obligation. If you were to say, no, he did fulfill it, but he allowed us to choose, I said, okay, no problem. What are the conditions? How do I choose? Height, size, weight, aql, ijma, what is the science? You'll find the Rashidun tell us four of them. First one was in Saqif al Sahaba. There were only three Muhajir, all were Ansars. Right? Abdurrahman ibn Jarrah, Abu Bakr, Amr, three people from Muhajir. The rest were all Ansars. This Abu Bakr is chosen as a caliph. He becomes a caliph. The second caliph is appointed by the first. There was no Ijma, there was no communication from anybody. It was just appointed. Third one was chosen by a group of six people, which Umar ibn Khattab set and gave veto power to Abdurrahman ibn Awf to have two votes. Because there were five, there were six people. And he gave him a vote to make it seven, and he gave him two votes. Okay, he was the deciding factor. So, is this in the Sharia? Did the Prophet say, when you choose a Khalifa, put six people and give the seventh veto power? Is there is some rule like that? You find the fourth Khalifa is chosen by the people. The Caliph uh, Uthman is killed, and people come to Imam Ali's house, and they insist that he should become the Khalifa, and so on. So you find we've got four different ways of appointment to the Khilafah. 
Why did it stop at the fourth? In fact, if we read Sunan Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, all the Sahih Sitta, it's clear the Prophet said, after me there will be 12 Khalifas over you, and they shall give to Quraysh, and the rest has not been remembered. Now people say, this is Khabar Wahid, there's only one Hadith. If it's in Sahih Bukhari, from our brother's perspective, from Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, it's not a question of saying one or two or three. Okay, you can say Da'if, but it's not Sahih then. The, the Sahih, the Bukhari, is, is not Sahih then, it's Da'if. You cannot be Da'if, you see, or Mutawatir. It's, it's either or it's not. Well, it's clear. The question that comes in thereafter is that uh, the Prophet said, after me, there will be 12. So the idea of four categorically being accepted, I agree, it's generically accepted in the schools of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. But I, I, as a Muslim, not as a Shia, as a Muslim, whether I'm Sunni or Shia, it doesn't matter here, I'm being very straightforward about this, is where did the Prophet appoint them? If he didn't, I can't follow that. You have to ask. The Prophet has to pick somebody because in the Quran, Hajjat al Wida, it's in the Quran. In Surah Al Ma'idah, Ya ayyuha al Rasul, Balligh ma unzil ilayka min Rabbi. Wa in lam taf'al, fama balaghta risalat. Subhanallah, Allah ya'asimuka min al nas. Look at the verse. It's specific. Oh Rasul, not even Nabi. Ya ayyuha al Rasul. Why Rasul? Because he's going to do, he's going to deliver something. That's why he's a Rasul now. So Allah is addressing Ya ayyuha al Rasul, not Ya ayyuha al Nabi. Ya ayyuha al Rasul, Balligh ma unzil. Reveal what has been commanded of you. This was revealed the last year before the Prophet's departure. Examine, brothers, and all of us. The Prophet had established Salah. He had purified the Kaaba. Fasting was already promulgated. Hajj was set. Right? Islam was set. The laws was all complete. It was on the last part of our Prophet's departure. And Allah commands, بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِرْ وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُ And if you don't do this, فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَةً You have not delivered the Risala. Wow, wait a minute. I look back at this and say, what do you mean? Prophet established Salah. Isn't Salah the pillar of my faith? He has established fasting and Hajj. Has he not established already? Allah says, if you don't do this, you haven't delivered. That means the appointment is pivotal. And this is where the whole history of the story of Ghadir comes into play. Where Ghadir, where the Prophet says, مَنْ كُنْتُمْ مَوْلَى فَهَادَ عَلِيُّ مَوْلَى Whoever I am the master of, this Ali is the master. Now, Mawla here clearly means master, not friend. The Prophet would not stop 150,000 people in the hot desert to tell them he is my friend. Imam Ali was his brother. When the Prophet was in Mecca, there were two Ikhwan al Muslimin. Two. I want you to understand this. Two. The Prophet commanded in Mecca, because there were a small group, he said, each one of you take each other as a brother to unite, to help each other. Who was the Prophet's brother? Unanimously, Sunni and Shia both agree. Ali and Abi Talib. When the Prophet came to Medina, he did another Ikhwan al Muslimin. Second, we mean Muslim Brotherhood. He said, one Muhajir, take one Ansar. This was the rule. We all know the, the rule. One Muhajir, take one Ansar. Don't forget this, sisters and brothers, okay? One Muhajir, one Ansar. Meaning, one person from Mecca, one person from Medina. Come together, take yourselves as brothers. Who was the Prophet's brother? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Oh, hold on a second. How? Muhajir Ansar. The Prophet is Muhajir. He should take an Ansar. No, he doesn't. He takes Ali ibn Abi Talib as his brother. Why? Because the Prophet says, I am not of the Muhajir. I am Rasulullah and Ali is min Ahl al-Bayt. He is Ahl al-Bayt. He's different. He's not considered the Muhajir. So you find the Prophet again takes him as his brother. Why does he take him as his brother? This is a bonding, it's an eternal kind of a bonding that the Prophet takes as a, as, 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 a, as a symbol. So here, you should think the Prophet should take somebody from but he doesn't. He takes somebody from his own uh, family. Why? As I mentioned before, even when the command of Allah came, our messenger started his mission with the appointment, and in between he appointed, and in the end he appointed. He had to. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. His whole system doesn't make sense. Why these Imams are necessary? Because let's be practical. The Prophet came at the age of 40. He delivered the message, correct? For 13 years he was under subjection by the Meccans. He couldn't preach. In fact, Allah did not allow him to lift a finger. Ammar ibn Yasir is being punished in the desert. His face is being burnt. And Ammar doesn't do anything. 
He asked him to relinquish his faith, and Mari bin Yasser comes back, and he cries to the Prophet. He said, they forced me to relinquish la ilaha Allah. And what did the Prophet say? He said, oh, Mari, they do it again. Relinquish it. Because what lies in your heart, Allah knows. People have addressed this as taqiyya. Taqiyya is always, it's this form of hiding in the Shia's use taqiyya. Taqiyya is in the Quran. When Allah says your life is in danger, you have to relinquish your faith. Allah says, relinquish it. Save your life. Even pork is allowed for us to eat in the Quran if our lives are on the line. Quran says there's no sin for you. This flesh of swine which has been forbidden for you, if your life was on the line, eat it. There's no sin for you. This is the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what you find is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that the Ahlul Bayt, their position is different that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing. That this appointment factor is pivotal and fundamental. That when our Prophet starts his mission, who does he go to? His near ones. And he asks only, you never find a historical book, even Muhammad Hussein Haikal, who used to write, he's written a book called Al Hayat Muhammad, the life of Muhammad. He's a famous historian who's written uh, Al Hayat Muhammad. You find even him. He writes this, the, the Feast of Dhul Ashira. He says, the Prophet asks, who will be my successor and my protector in the beginning of the mission? So this appointment didn't just come the last minute, people were surprised. No, it was consistent across the board. This is where the argument stands. You know, and I'm, I'm not here to bash the caliphs. You know, all of them have done good things in Islam. You know, no one is saying, oh, this one is bala, this one, no. It's not for me to judge. I can see a very great person next to me saying, I don't know the day of judgment where Allah will place this person. It's not for me to pass in judgment on that. I'm not here to pass judgment. It's none of my business. My business between you and I, Sunni and Shia alike, come together and say, listen, Rasulullah did this, this is in the Quran, this is the proof, this is the evidence. Let's discuss it, absorb it. Once you understand it, you understand its principles, follow it. It's your obligation. It's not a question of taking titles, Sunni versus Shia. That's a really good explanation that you just made. Um, but the only problem with that explanation also said about Abu Bakr that I asked everybody about faith. I asked him to accept Islam. And the only one to have no doubt and accept Islam was Abu Bakr. The great points you're making about Ali, that's, I mean, that's well accepted, but also you have to remember that he made great points about all of the world. No, no, you, brother, don't get me Look at Ammar ibn Yasir. Look at Abu Dhar. Did our Prophet not say there's no truthful man under the sky like Abu Dhar? Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. What happened to Abu Dhar? Where did he die? Do you know? Abu Dhar was exiled by the third caliph, thrown out. And he died in Rabda, which is a desert. Abu Dhar was the most honest man under the sky. Why is he dying in the desert? No one to bury him? He died of starvation in the desert? Brother, you and I have to obey what the Prophet considered good and not good. Not what the people thereafter did. If the Prophet considered Ammar ibn Yasir to be of the Haq, it's a man of truth. Right? We have to understand that. And the Prophet said, Oh Ammar, you will be killed on the good side. There will be my enemy fighting and you will be martyred on the good side. When Ammar ibn Yasir was martyred in the Battle of Safin, Muawiyah was on the other side, claiming to be a caliph. And people really remember the hadith. The Prophet said, Oh Ammar, you will die on the good side and the evil doers will kill you. So uh, uh, you find Muawiyah said, say, Yes, Ali Nabi Talib is the cause of this. If he would not have brought Ammar, he would not have died. So Imam retorts, then you can say Hamza, you can accuse the Prophet too, because Hamza said the shuhada, and if the Prophet didn't bring him to Uhud, he would not have become shaheed either. And, and Muawiyah didn't know what to say. These trickeries cannot go on. The question is, if they could have been the Prophet after me, it would have been Umar ibn Khattab, for example. Did the Prophet appoint him? You know, it begs the question as follows. Imagine if my Prophet says, if there is this great personality who could be a prophet after me, he would be. Okay? Nobody's passing judgment. Possible. Could be. But the prophet leaves and doesn't appoint him. Doesn't appoint him at all. Nowhere does Abu Bakr even say that I am appointing you, Omar, because the prophet wanted me to appoint you. No. Did Omar, you say, you mentioned Omar ibn Khattab, was, uh, the prophet said, did he lead prayers? Was that the condition of him becoming a khalifa? No. How about Uthman? 
You said, you said that Abu Bakr led prayers, and therefore he becomes. Is that the condition? That if you lead prayers? Okay, what, what are there many people who led prayers in the Prophet's time? Why did they not become uh, candidates for the caliphate? Why was the caliphate, for example, exclusively among the Quraysh? Why did none of the, of the Ansars become Khalifa? None. What did the Ansars, the Prophet, after defeating the, the enemies, after taking Mecca in Hunayn, you find he took all the, 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 the loot, most of the loot that they defeated from the enemies, the Kuffar, he gave it to the Meccans. And the people of Medina said to the Prophet, Prophet, you're giving them too much. He says, I'm giving myself to you. Because they were wondering, after this settlement, now that Mecca has been cleaned up, maybe the Prophet will go back to his birthplace. The Prophet said, no. You gave me sanctuary. I have given my life to you. And I'm coming back to Medina. And the people of Medina were so happy. They were so happy to be with the Prophet. And the Prophet comes back to Medina. That's why he's known as Medina Munawwara. Right? The Prophet, it's, it's named after the Holy Prophet. Even the Jews knew this. By the way, you know why the Jews were in Medina? Quraiza, Banu Quraiza, Banu Qaymuqa. Why were they there? Subhanallah, look at the plan of God. Jews were never seen to be in Medina. In their scriptures, it said the Messiah, the awaited Savior, will come in Medina. So they moved a long time before waiting. And they used to taunt the Aws and Khazraj, the two tribes, that soon our Messiah is going to show up and we'll show you. And the Prophet does show up. And they go and ask him every question. He answers every question. He says, but there's a problem. You're not a, not a Jew. You're not a, we can't accept it. <laughs> so Medina is the Prophet. He comes to them. Was there any member from Medina who became a Khalifa? If we're going to talk about Sisala, goodness, right? Okay. Why is it tilted in one direction only to the Quraysh? And specifically to one spe specific groups of people. Why? We have to be asking those questions as Muslims. That our obligation on judgment day Allah will ask us, uh, did you obey Allah? وَمَنْ يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Right? لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ عَمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا In Surah Hujurat, if you obey Allah and His Messenger, your deeds will not be nullified. But brother, I give you an example. You mentioned this, right? And with due respect to the second caliph Umar ibn Khattab. I want you to ponder on this one. There is no verse in the Quran pertaining about this kind of to Imam Ali but here I'm going to ask you a question. I was recently in Medina for Hajj. And on the grave where Umar ibn Khattab is, there's an ayah. Anybody been to Medina? You've been to Medina, right? There's an ayah right above his grave. Have you read the ayah? That ayah is specifically placed because of what happened in history. That verse in the Quran is referring to him. You don't know? Okay. It's in Surah Hujurat. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawti al-nabi. Wa la tajharu lahu bil qawli ka jahri ba'dikum li ba'din an tahbata a'amalikum. Lest your deeds get wiped out. Wa antum la tashuru. Meaning they raised, he raised his voice to such that level that the Prophet became annoyed. He became annoyed and the ayah came. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawti al-nabi. So, greatness when we talk about, you know, who's going to be a prophet, who's going to be a khalif. At the end of the day, I don't want to judge, because there are great companions who were with the prophet, who fought side by side with the prophet, who never abandoned the battlefield, who, who were always truthful with the prophet. I never argue this. Listen, why doesn't Ahmad ibn Yasser become a khalifa? I mean, I think he was a great man. How about Abu Dhar? I think Abu Dhar should become a khalifa. You, if the prophet said, no, there's no man who's more truthful under the sky than Abu Dhar. He should become a khalifa. No. They were, they were good people. It's not for you and I to make a question. The question is very clear. Allah says, I have to appoint. I give an example. And Musa alayhi salam, doesn't Allah say to Musa, Idhab ila Fir'aun, go to Fir'aun, innahu taha, go. He is a troublemaker. What does Musa say? Subhanallah, it's in the Quran. Musa says, Waja'alni waziran min ahli Harun akhihi. Give waja'alni. Look at the word ja'ala. Again, it's played here. Musa is saying to Allah, Oh Allah, give me a helper. وَجَعَلْنِي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِ هَارُونَ أَخِي It's my brother, so that we too can go to Fir'aun together. Musa doesn't say, listen Allah, you told me if I right? go, okay, I'm in charge. Leave me, I'll take care of everything. No, even that Musa doesn't do. The Quran says, no. Musa turns to Allah and says, وَجَعَلْنِي وَزِيرًا Give me a helper. Meaning Allah is showing that on these missions, it cannot be because of salah, because of association with the Prophet, or the Prophet said certain things. If there's no direct appointment, it's a questionable issue. It's a question. So say now, did the Prophet appoint? He didn't appoint. He said, well, how can I follow that? 
From, from the Shia perspective, it's clear that Imam Ali al was appointed. The 11 Imams that followed were mentioned by name. The Prophet said there'll be this one, and then this one, and then this one, by name, each one. Even Mamun, who was the caliph of the time, at that time knew who the Imam was. That he took Ar-Rida, the eighth Imam, and pulled him from Medina up to, to Persia, because he had set up his, uh, his base, because he was fighting with his brother Amin. And there were, the caliph was split between two. There were two brothers fighting, because their father, Harun Rashid, had, you know, had, uh, there was a dispute, and they were fighting, and then finally Mamun kills his brother and takes the caliphate and reigns over it. And the eighth Imam is pulled in that. Mamun knew who the eighth Imam is. He was not a mystery, like, who are you? Where'd you come from? No. Every caliph that came in time and history knew who the Imams were, who the Prophet had appointed. It's not a secret. I hope I've been fair and just in the, in the discussion. Yes. Um, we are running out of time? Yes, no problem, inshallah. We can, we, I think the brothers say we, we're out of time, but what we can do is we can discuss it after if you want, with pleasure. You know, we're here to, uh, to discuss further. Look, brothers and sisters, this is an excellent discussion. And remember, the, the intent and the goal is to discuss and bring ourselves closer to Rasulullah, closer to the Quran, closer to the submission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whichever direction it may be, that's our obligation. It doesn't matter which way it is, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I'm very grateful. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this opportunity uh, to be among you, my brothers. And you've been very respectful, very kind, very patient with me. I, and I'm, I'm gratified and I'm honored. And I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah grants us all wisdom, understanding, patience, and the true will to submit to Him and to reach that intended goal that Allah created us for. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.